Ladies and gentlemen, hi. My name is Daniel Naujoks, and I'm a professor here at Columbia University's School of International Public Affairs. <clears throat> and I have the privilege of directing the UN Studies program here, as well as a newly established UN Partnership Initiative. Um, on behalf of Dean um, Carrieri Milo and the entire CIPA community, it is my privilege to um, welcome His Excellency Dennis Francis, the President of the General Assembly. Um, I'm very thrilled to have you here. SIPA has had a long, long connection to the United Nations and to multilateral questions. We were established um, in a way to produce talent for the UN and to rethink multilateral questions. Um, today, there's many, many linkages between what the UN is doing and what we are doing. 118 of our current faculty are either current UN staff members previous staff members, or very much engage with multilateral um, questions. And we have some in the, in, in the audience here. We have Mosi Antonio Ocampo, um, the um, former um, Undersecretary General for um, um, Economic and um, Social Affairs. Um, and we have Jean-Marie Guénaud, who is Undersecretary General for Peacekeeping, and many other um, experts um, in the room and, of course, um, on our, our faculty. We have 1,200 um, alumni working on multilateral questions in the UN, in the World Bank, in um, at the African Union, in different uh, institutions the world over, um, including um, um, also our new flagship initiatives that Professor Guénaud leads the Kent program on um, global leadership um, um, on conflict resolution and others, such as a blog on um, uh, multilateralism in action. SIPA last year engaged in five new policy and global policy challenges, geopolitical stability, democratic resilience, climate and sustainable development, inclusive prosperity, macroeconomic stability, technology and innovation. And all of those have links to multilateral processes. And there's nobody who is better um, situated to talk about these things than our esteemed guest. President um, um, Dennis Francis has a very impressive career, spending more than 40 years um, in the diplomatic service of um, Trinidad and Tobago. He um, has the distinction of serving um, as the longest standing ambassador in this country, 18 years as ambassador, um, um, which took him to many different countries, different positions. Among um, the many positions he held, he was director for multilateral relations. He was senior advisor to the foreign minister on all multilateral questions including on climate change and the negotiations of the 2030 agenda. We are wearing the SDG pin here, both um, um, as a testament to the importance of the SDGs and the work that um, President Francis has done at that time. He was also permanent representative um, of Trinidad and Tobago to the UN in Geneva and to many UN en entities, such as the Human Rights Council, the World Trade Organization, UNESCO, and others. And he has led many national delegations, for example, um, to the first um, um, universal um, um, periodic review of Tobago, or to the UNCTAD conference um, in 2008. As a fellow academic and educator, he facilitates um, training courses at the Diplomatic Academy um, of the Caribbean, an institution that he helped um, chiefly to establish. Um, and he wrote a book um, on heads of missions, where a lot of his wisdom and experience on leading um, um, missions and leading um, um, a country's diplomatic endeavors were um, um, established. And Professor Francis also taught at the University of the West Indies Institute of International Relations, so um, a dear colleague, um, and he um, um, graduated from that university as well as from SAIS um, in, in DC. President Francis, Trust in the United Nations these days is being questioned and tested on a daily basis. Trust from citizens, from governments who want to see the UN be stronger, create a safer world, a more effective world, ending conflicts. And you speak about rebuilding trust, reigniting global solidarity. And these are very important objectives that us at the Columbia community share. But could you share how exactly can this be done? What are the key barriers to reigniting um, global solidarity and rebuilding trust? And how can they be overcome? First of all, let me say uh, a pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I always enjoy interacting with the next generation of global leaders. Um, 
But I have something of a slightly different take on the question that you've asked. There's no doubt that there is a deficit of trust. I think we need to define more precisely where that deficit resides. Um, it is true that there is a deficit of trust, particularly among the general public in the United Nations. Um, but it is not quite accurate to suggest that governments mistrust or lack trust in the UN. In fact, the evidence suggests quite the opposite. Um, I think it was 140 heads of state and government who came in September to high level week. They only come for one reason, really. They come because they trust the UN. Um, so the deficit in trust does not reside with government's view of the UN. Yes, they want it to perform more effectively. That is entirely true, but there is not mistrust between the government and the UN. The mistrust that really exists is among member states, is among member states. Let's understand that very clearly. And there's a reason, there are several reasons for it, but at its very core, The real reason is the changed global geopolitics. Where you have the big players in something of an uncomfortable relationship with each other. Um, there's a sense in which the world was an easier place to comprehend. Uh, at the height of what was what we knew to be communism, that era has passed. We ushered in a new era. But that new era has, has brought with it change dynamics in global politics. And there is now increased competition for power. And as students of international relations, you'd know that power does not necessarily or exclusively refer to might, to military capacity. Uh, prestige is power in international relations as well. So there's increased competition for power and influence in the system. And of course, in 2021, the world is a different place from what it was in 2000. You have new rising powers in Asia, in Latin America, that make the situation more complex. We are moving, we've moved from a bipolar world to a multipolar world. With um, some countries actually rivaling traditional leaders for influence, both regionally and at the global level. And that provides the stuff of disagreement um, so that, uh, for example, uh, uh, the uh, Security Council of the UN um, often is not able to reach agreement or reach consensus on many important issues simply because of this, the importation of ge the geopolitical dynamics into the United Nations. It's inevitable. And so uh, increased competition, and when we say competition, we are talking politically, economically. Uh, I saw a documentary, uh, I think two weeks ago, that suggested 
that within, I think, uh, two years or 10 years, India would have surpassed China as the most populous country on earth. India is a technological powerhouse, still a developing country in many ways, but a technological powerhouse. When I was at the WTO, it was quite extraordinary that to a significant degree, the Indians shaped the multilateral negotiations on trade. 20 years ago, that would not have been possible. So <clears throat> um, there is this lack of trust among the general public. And I'd like to spend a little time talking about that as well, because the general public, and in fact, many people who, perhaps some of you, tend to define the UN largely in terms of the performance of the Security Council. The Security Council is but one organ a critically important one of the UN, but there are two others. There's the General Assembly, which one might refer to loosely as the World Parliament, comprised of 193 member states. And then there's the Economic and Social Council, uh, which develops policies and programs around development in a sort of advisory capacity. When the, gen when, the, when the Security Council fails to take action, that hits the news at the top of the news. Everyone is anxious about what the Security Council does or does not do. And if it fails, as it has been demonstrating a tendency to do because of the use of the veto, and I know you know what the veto is, then people say, the UN is useless. The UN is irrelevant. Its value is diminished. But that is only the council. Now, while that is going on, in the council, other things, good things, are happening in other organs in the UN. The General Assembly, which I have the honor to, to preside over as president, and where the primary focus is not peace and security as it is in the Security Council, but there is a role for the General Assembly in matters of peace and security, a residual rule. The General Assembly focuses on such issues as development and human rights. And within those two broad pillars, you have a plethora of issues, such as, for example, just to name a few, um, uh, violence against women and girls. Um, uh, climate change, sustainable development, um, pandemic preparedness, a whole host of issues. Now, so people believe, tend to believe that when the Security Council fails, the UN has failed. And to some degree, that is not incorrect, but it is not the full story because In the instant case of what has been happening, the hostilities taking place in Gaza, the Security Council failed five times to reach to agree a resolution on what needed to be done. Failed. The veto was used repeatedly. It was only in the month of November, under the Chinese presidency of the Security Council, presidency of the council rotates every month. 
the month of November, China sat in the, in the president's chair in the council. That is when and only when the council was able to agree a resolution on Gaza. But the General Assembly had already agreed a resolution on Gaza two and a half or three weeks before. Uh, so it was covered in the news, but some people may have missed it. And of course, because we are not the Security Council, we don't necessarily get the same level of attention as the council. Having said all of that, I'll now deal with the question of trust and how we can set about repairing it. Uh, trust doesn't disappear overnight. It is an accumulation of things that cause people, countries in many ways, behave like people. It shouldn't surprise us because they are run by people. Um, and sometimes uh, you, can, you can actually trace the relevance or peculiarity of the leader's personality in the way the country behaves, personality theory in international relations. Um, <clears throat> so it's an accumulation of things over the years that have caused this mistrust to become so intense among member states. Such as things, things such as commitments given, not honored. It is the worst thing that you can do in international affairs. Green Climate Fund, I'm sure you must have heard of it. It was agreed in 2015 in Paris. $100 billion per year for five years. After three years, no money in the fund. So why should developing countries I'm being the agent provocateur now. Why should developing countries trust the developed countries when they make commitments of a financial nature, which in the past they have not honored? These things undermine confidence in the system. That's why I say countries are like human beings. More than that, you have the geopolitical dynamics, which is a competition for power and prestige uh, and profile. Power, the three P's, power, prestige, profile. And this competition is ongoing. Uh, I've seen written in academia uh, that uh, the entire thrust of Russian foreign policy is to undermine US policy wherever and whenever there is an opportunity. Note how I said this. I'm not claiming that myself. I'm in no position to do so because I represent 194 countries. I said, I have seen in academia so I've attributed it to academia, that, that the focus, the thrust of Russian foreign policy is to undermine US policy. It may well be so, I do not know. Um, and we know, of course, that there is a tension and uneasiness between the US and China, built up over several years and surrounding several issues issues of human rights, issues of Taiwan, issues of the uh, various claims uh, in the South China Seas, et cetera, et cetera. Intellectual property rights, <laughs> a number of issues. Um, all of this compounded by a situation where you have had a global pandemic that has for all practical purposes, 
uh, thrown the, 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 the global economy into recession. You've had the, the war in Ukraine that no one expected. Um, uh, you have had uh, the disruption of um, global supply, supply chains causing inflation. You have had food, energy uh, crises. And on top of that now, you have hostilities in Gaza. This is not an environment that builds confidence. Amazingly, the markets are doing very well. The financial, global financial markets are doing very well. But this is not a market really. This is not an atmosphere that creates a lot of confidence. People are um, tired mentally because it's been a very stressful, demanding, unprecedented period where all of these negatives seem to have come together to form a perfect storm. And so when that happens, the prevailing mood is one of conservatism. It's not an easy environment in which to sit around and to make agreements that demand, demand a substantial uh, level of, um, of flexibility on the part of all players. The multilateral negotiations are about making a deal. And going into multilateral negotiations, you know, you know what you want out of it, but you must know that you will never get everything you want out of it. You can't because everyone, the, the whole 194, 93 countries must fit under that umbrella. Somehow countries must think I am better off participating in this agreement rather than staying out of it. That is the incentive to join the consensus. But the atmosphere has to be right for that to happen relatively easily. It never is easy. Sometimes it's more difficult than other times. Um, today, uh, we, uh, I attended a, a, I host, chaired a meeting this morning on oceans and the law of the sea. The law of the sea took, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea took about 12 or 15 years to negotiate. Can you imagine that? 12 or 15 years. But it remains the constitution of the sea and in fact has contributed significantly to international peace and security. Because before the law of the sea, the, the principle that operated was in Latin, uti posidetis, whoever gets there first, it belongs to you. And so you can imagine the clashes that would take place on the seas regarding territory, regarding resources. So it is not the best time really to be making deals on complex issues such as climate change, such as um, a pl the plastics convention that is being negotiated now in Geneva, even on the sustainable development goals because of the atmospherics. But we persist in it because we believe in it. And we believe in it because it is the way, the Sustainable Development Goals, is the way to lift people out of poverty and misery. It's a broad agenda to improve the standard of living and welfare and well-being of people across the world. So that a young girl living in rural India or rural Africa will have access to a quality education that would be life-changing for that young girl, 
rather than being left behind, not going to school, not having an education, and having her life options cut off simply for the fact that she cannot, she cannot marshal the skills to be able to work, except perhaps in some menial way. And so the sustainable development goals remain top of the agenda at the United Nations. And one of the ways of building trust that I have been doing, because the conference room, it's just, if you can imagine you're having a lecture, it's sort of very formal. You know, you, you, you observe certain behaviors in the lecture theater. But the minute you go outside, it's as if you become a different person. You can be freer. You, can, you might say things outside that you will not say to the lecturer in the room. It's the same thing with diplomacy. So we try to take the delegates out of the conference room in small groups and get them to interact on a one-to-one -one basis. When you do that, all of the formality subsides. And then you start understanding better what, what are they thinking? Why is he emphasizing this point on, and not that one? And so you start a conversation because multilateral diplomacy is really about communicating effectively. You start a conversation. Once that conversation goes, uh, starts, you don't know where it will take you. And often it will take you to a good result. And that's one of the things we are doing, trying to have our delegates engage in small groups, in non-traditional settings, outside the conference room in order to get familiar and comfortable with each other to facilitate formal negotiations and rebuild trust. Thank you so much for sharing. This is like a, excellent tips for bringing something from a formal setting into an informal setting and getting things done um, that can't happen necessarily in the procedures that are prescribed by an organization. Um, in your vision statement for your presidency, you highlight that the UN should promote, and you, you and General Assembly under your leadership, um, peace, prosperity, progress, sustainability for the 21st century. So these are very, very big topics. And um, you talked a little bit about the SDGs and things you're doing. Can you expand a little bit more on that? And you talked about what you're doing, um, the, the, the um, Israel-Hamas war, and how that has affected, obviously, um, the relationship within the UN and the member, member states. And you, you were able to get everybody, not everybody, but uh, the vast majority of states to um, adopt an important resolution. So can you share a little bit more about how exactly you see the role of the General Assembly and your role as president of the General Assembly to promote those really important, but very large, almost unachievable goals? Um, and and what, what can you tell us from the process of adopting the um, Israel Hamas um, resolution? Okay. Um, yes, I've, uh, uh, I've, I've called them my watchwords, uh, peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability. And basically, that's, it's a sort of, uh, it's a summary, really, of uh, four categories that constitute the major issues confounding the international system. Okay, peace, it sounds very almost cliche, but when you look at the situation, you realize it's not. Um, international relations is all about power. It's all about power. Uh, and therefore, and the use of power, how it is used. Um, the UN was set up primarily to avoid war, to save mankind from the scourge of two world wars, where the atrocities committed were just so egregious that it was thought that if there was a way that we could avoid this, we should. It's in the interest of human civilization to avoid this. And therefore, um, you know, there's a sense in which 
people generally, including some of us diplomats, tend to think that the absence of war is peace. Things are peaceful, and so we don't need to be concerned. But consider this. No one really anticipated well in advance that Mr. Putin was going to drive his tanks over the border into Ukraine. And certainly, no one anticipated that there would be an attack on Israel on October the 7th. Now, we have to be a little cautious here because Hamas is not a state. It is not a state. It's in some ways, it might act as if it is a state, but it is not. However, you had an incursion cross boundary and interna in international affairs now, Increasingly, groups are being formed that act transboundary. Trans so no one expected this. Like that, the peace was broken. It's gone. And when it's gone, we all pay the price, sometimes literally, in the supermarket or at the shopping mall. Or sometimes, and particularly now, where social media and television, you are in the war. You can see it. Every time you turn on the television, the, you, are, you are in the battlefield. The media has brought us to the battlefield. And it's having an impact on you, whether you're aware of it or not. It's impacting you. So peace is something, therefore, that in my view, we need to work harder at cultivating because we take it for granted. But when it's gone, it's calamitous. Everything changes. Everything changes. And so we need to be able to avoid situations of conflict and military hostility. That means we need to make an investment in creating the conditions in which peace would thrive. It means working harder for peace. It means talking to people like you and younger because you're the leaders of tomorrow. You know, um, trying to get people to understand that without peace, it would be totally inconsequential for the SDGs if there was no peace. What would be the point of educating a child, giving them the tools they need to enter into the labor market, and perhaps in a very sophisticated way, if the economy was going to collapse, simply because investors don't invest in times of war, markets tend to freeze in times of war. Everything goes off balance. So it's in all our interests collectively. And this is the concept of collective security now. It's in all our interests to work for stability in the international system because stability means predictability. Investors like to be able to crunch their numbers and, and evaluate or assess what their profitability will be, their rates of profitability over the next three or four years in a market. And perhaps if that market is underperforming, they might decide to withdraw from that market. So we need to invest and nurture and cultivate peace. We haven't been doing enough of that in the past. Some of this can be done uh, based on something called preventive diplomacy which is where you detect that there is a rising tension that if it is not effectively managed will boil over and cause an explosion, a disruptive explosion that will eventually lead to a war or to hostilities to get in early while there is still time to bring the parties together to talk 
you know, I've heard a lot of people say that the UN is a talk shop. And I say to them, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because guess what? While you're talking, you're not on the battlefield. You're not on the battlefield. You're talking. The problem comes when you stop talking and decide, well, let's, uh, let's take it outside. That is in no one's interest. And the reality is that violence does not necessarily create peace. Sometimes it can make the situation worse. Intergenerationally, violence does not create peace. So the wise thing, that's why one of the core principles of the UN is the Pacific settlements of disputes. You have a conflict, you have a dispute, let's sit around the table and talk about it and work it out. If we apply ourselves and make a brilliant enough effort, we will probably be able to resolve it. But while we are talking, we have postponed taking up guns and arms. Um, so we need to work for peace. Of course, prosperity will not happen without peace. You hear it said, there's no development without peace, no peace without development. There's a nexus there that brings these two concepts, these two realities together, okay? And what, it, what it, it, it relates to is the fact that it is unsustainable to live in a world where there is such a wide and growing gap between the wealthy and the poor, and not just internationally, nationally as well, within countries, those gaps, you have to, you, this is all about inclusion. You have to make room to bring people into the system so that they feel a part of it, so that they feel that they have a stake in it, they can benefit from it. The minute you start excluding people or marginalizing people, you're creating the basis for conflict because they're observing your lifestyle. You with the, you know, the, the latest version of the, Apple, of the iPhone. As soon as the Apple company announces the phone, people are lining up from two o'clock in the morning because, you know, in your very advanced um, lifestyle, you need to get the most sophisticated phone. But what about the people left back in, Ghana or in Indonesia, way out in the country, who will never touch an iPhone, but more than that, probably do not know where their next meal is coming from. It's unsustainable to create that. However, if that person, those persons could be brought into the system so that they can have a chance of having a relatively decent job to look after their families, educate their children, huh? pay their taxes, they're not asking for a free ride. They want to do the same responsible things that we do, pay their taxes and not be living in a, in a, in a house uh, where they're getting wet when it rains. They don't necessarily want to live on Park Avenue, but they want to be to have decent shelter, decent health care. Is it too much to ask of a human being? Certainly not. That's what the Sustainable Development Goals are, to provide people with the basic means of sustenance so that they do not live in poverty, in abject poverty from one generation to the next. In many, many parts of the world, poverty exists for generations in the same family. 
that something has to be wrong with that picture. And so the Sustainable Development Goals is an attempt on the part of the UN to address and resolve those problems, to lift people up. That is why the human rights dimension is so important because it's morally and ethically wrong and entirely unacceptable that we should be living here in this magnificent dynamic city of New York, enjoying all of the, the, the freedoms and the rights that we have, but people who are no different from us. If, they, if we were to examine their, their DNA, they have a double helix just like we do. Their blood is not gray or yellow. It's red, just like ours, okay? Um, those people are locked out of that in many cases. Their, their rights are being trampled upon or they are being denied their rights for whatever reason. And so um, it's wrong, it's morally wrong simply to decide that you are going to discriminate against someone simply because of the color of their skin, their religious belief, their sexual orientation, regardless of what your personal views are, it's wrong. Consider for a moment, ask yourself, how would I feel if I were discriminated against? That's the standard. How would, put yourself in that person's position. How would I feel if someone refused to deal with me simply because I'm Muslim or I'm Jewish? Wrong. It will never be right. On the 10th of December, we are going to celebrate in the UN, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. The first line of the declaration says, all human beings are born equal in rights. We have the same rights. And if these rights are not given to you by the government or by your pastor or indeed by your parents, you are born with them. They are in it. You can't be separated from your rights. So what the UN is advocating is that people everywhere must enjoy the same rights, the same rights. That's why, that's why we are working hard to rid the world of violence against women, to ensure that all girls, regardless of where they are, go to school and get an education, uh, that women should receive the same pay and compensation as men for equivalent jobs. This is something that is a huge issue in many parts of the world. Discrimination in any form is wrong and sets up forces that create dissension in society. If you want to build a stable, successful, cohesive society, you've got to treat everyone justly the same. Everyone will have the same rights in law. And when those rights are violated or abridged, they ought to be addressed, either through the court system or some other system that works in that community. Um, the worst part of being a moderator is trying to um, Cut somebody who has so much to offer. Um, we're a little past our allotted time, but I think uh, the president um, has a few more minutes. So um, we could open the floor very briefly to two or three questions. Um, I would love to have a longer discussion, but in the interest of time, I don't think that is feasible. So um, we have two people with, with microphones and um, two or three questions. Um, um, raise your hands and I will ask... Um, yeah, so there's one there. Okay, one in the back there. Amy. And 
Yeah. If we can ask them all three and then you answer all three of them, that is okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, thank you for being here. Um, uh, you mentioned about the 75 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it raises the question that uh, the Palestinian people have also been under um, a siege uh, since the last 70, 80 years, since 1948, Nagba. Uh, and then you said that people, the Human Rights Declaration says that people are born with those rights, but the Palestinian people haven't had those rights for the last 70, 80 years. You also mentioned that um, on October 7th, um, peace disappeared suddenly uh, after the Hamas attack. But do you think that the people of Gaza were ever in peace given the fact that they were under a siege since 1967? Hamas only came into being in 2007. Keeping in mind those questions, what do you think is the solution to the um, uh, Palestinian issue, uh, given the fact that they've been living under the Israeli apartheid for the last 80 years or so? Um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you, President Francis. I really agree with what you say about peace. It's nothing we can take for granted, but we need, all need to work hard to cultivate it. And given the recent year, there has been a rise in um, a regional conflict and also geopolitical tension. So I'm asking how will UN continue to um, create consensus among its member states and also work to um, promote peace and other SDG goals regionally and globally? We have one last question over there. I will stand because I'm not so tall. <laughs> um, okay, thank you, His Excellency. Uh, my question is, uh, can you tell me like uh, how you see the impact of underdeveloped countries in achieving global solidarity? And if these countries matter, so what would be in the United Nations, uh, specifically General Assembly's uh, member state impact and contribution to um, support the role of th these countries in, in the world or in achieving global solidarity? Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, uh, you were asking about the situation in Gaza and the fact that. Now, <clears throat> it, you, it's a valid question that you ask. That's the first thing I'd like to tell you. It's a valid question. Um, do I have the solution, the answer? No. But I can tell you what needs to happen um, incidentally, I should clarify that the resolution that we agreed in the General Assembly uh, called for, and every time I've spoken publicly on this issue, uh, I've made the same remarks because I believe them and I believe that was a pathway to uh, reducing the tensions in the Gaza and, in fact, um, bringing it to a halt. I've said that Hamas should return all the hostages at once without conditions. All. That there should be a complete ceasefire in order to save human lives, in order to save civilian lives. And that the authorities, the Israeli authorities, should make allowances for to allow access of humanitarian aid so that those in need of care could have that care. And that is uh, both the, the Palestinians, UN workers. We've lost a hundred and I think uh, five UN workers killed in Gaza. People who were doing their jobs to help humanity. They gave their lives trying to honor the values and principles of the UN and to help people who were desperately in need of care and assistance. Now, what needs to happen is we have the answer, you know. All the resolutions that have been passed in the United Nations, both in the Council and in the General Assembly over the years, we have the solution. We've just not done it. There has to be intensive negotiations for a two-state solution in the Middle East. It is the only way out, okay? 
The Palestinians deserve a home and Israel needs to know that it can exist in peace and security. Now, think for a minute. The hostilities go that have gone on, do you think that it helps that process? When little boys in Gaza, 10, 11, 12 years old, see their entire family wiped out, sometimes two or three generations of a family, do you really think that that little boy is going to be able to say, I forgive them? First, violence breeds violence. And that's why it's not a strategy for peace. It breeds violence. Um, so they need, there needs to be a process, a diplomatic process. It is going to be an extremely difficult one because there's a lot of water under that bridge. There's a lot of hurt and pain, but it needs to happen. Unfortunately, the temporary ceasefire has been broken and violence has started up all over again, making, in my view, a, a solution that much more difficult to achieve. Um, so you're not incorrect. The people of Gaza have been under siege for, men, for much longer than uh, one might think, um, but two wrongs do not make a right. You cannot go into people's homes in the dead of night, abduct their family members, take them to unknown locations. No, no, it's wrong. It ought never to have happened. Um, and at the same time, it is highly uh, irregular. And in fact, it constitutes a violation of international law for any country to indiscriminately uh, um, fire uh, missiles and bombs into a situation where civilians will be at risk. The international law does not permit that. Civilians are protected under the rules of war. So far, there have been close to 15,000 deaths in Gaza, and most of them women and children. It's, it's, it's really depressing and painful. It's a stain on our civilization that this is happening. You know, these are avoidable deaths. Most of them are avoidable deaths. It doesn't, it does not deny the fact that Israel has the right to defend itself. No one can question that. They were under attack. But indiscriminate military action does not, does not and cannot uh, uh, be uh, an acceptable way to proceed. Uh, collateral damage among human beings is never acceptable. Never. Human life is too sacred and too sacrosanct. It's a gift. It is a gift. And so we, we must treat it with value and with dignity. That's what the Universal Declaration is asking us to do. And that's what I hope you young people, you global leaders of tomorrow, uh, will stand up for and defend because it has to be defended. It is under duress. It has to be defended. If you want to be treated with respect, regardless of who you are, if you demand respect, you must show respect for others, for their views. You must be tolerant. You must be open. In fact, you will grow intellectually and socially by being open rather than being closed. So that's your challenge. OK, um, I think um, um, you want to go to the next question, because in a moment we have to, unfortunately, I think, um, come to an adjourn. End. Exactly, as, as, as important and meaningful all those answer discussions are. But I think we have to just have you again here another time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you were asking about. Uh, So, so I'm asking how UN will continue to 
create a consensus among its member states and also promote peace and other SDG goals like in well, the middle of conflict? First of all, you have to, we have to decide on an approach or on, on something to occupy our attention and to apply, uh, to diligently apply our, our minds to that members are interested in and want to discuss. We have to do that in order to keep them engaged, okay? Because again, like I said, they, they only come, con it's a very expensive business. Huh? Countries send delegations to live in this city. It's not a cheap city. If it ever was, it certainly isn't. And it's very expensive. So they will only make that investment if they believe that there is something that they can extract from it that is going to make the, their country stronger, better, more respected around the world. Now, um, and we've done that. We've done that because next year we will be negotiating something called the Summit of the Future, which is all about you guys. It's all about you. We're trying to look into the crystal ball to see, to anticipate what will be the challenges ahead globally that would need to be addressed multilaterally in order to preserve peace and stability, human rights, and, 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 and development. And so we're we are going to be negotiating the summit of the future. We are not quite sure in every detail what that will imply, but we know certain things. We know, for example, that artificial intelligence is going to have to number among that. We know that digitalization is going to be one of the areas that would have to be discussed, but so will peace and security in the 21st century. Where we, where we are having now uh, uh, a new generation of nuclear weapons, okay? And uh, they aren't just new in sophistication, they are new in other ways as well, in, in terms of delivery, that are more lethal than the older generation of nuclear weapons. In the context of a policy of MAD, and I know what you know what MAD is, mutually assured destruction. What does this imply for world peace and security? So we are looking at all of those issues because these are the issues that we know that, that delegations and countries would want to discuss the future. And I would ask you, I would urge you in this room, uh, to become involved, try and read about it, uh, because we'll actually be trying to shape society, the society that you will inherit. And so you should feel free to make a contribution to that, whether it is by writing to me or writing to the chairs or having a town hall meeting among your colleagues, because you know what kind of world you want to create. You have an idea. I'm sure you don't want to be living uh, uh, next door to, uh, to a known terrorist bomb maker, for example. So you can play a role by helping us to understand what's in your head, what sort of society, how would the health system work? You know, because it's your future, it's your civilization. And so we've done that. And the final question over here was, um, Ah, but I think we have to be really quick on that. Just I'll, I'll, in the interest in of time, in two minutes. <laughs> in two minutes, the UN has 194 members, 93 member states. A significant proportion of that, developing countries, broadly referred to as the global South. Maybe it's about 140 countries. Some of at different stages of development. Some big, some small. There is a view that some people hold that it's only the big countries that make a contribution to the UN. Not, not financial contribution. We all have to contribute financially. 
but shaping the world, determining the conditions under which people live and work. Really, it's the big guys with the big influence who do that, not true. Developing countries play an extremely crucial role in the UN, including small countries, very small countries like mine. Some of you may not know, I'm sure, for example, that a former president of Trinidad and Tobago, now deceased, was quite literally the grandfather of the International Criminal Court. He spent his entire life working to establish this court because there was no other court dealing with issues like genocide and war crimes. People would commit those crimes and simply walk away from it. They can't do that anymore. Small countries have made and continue to make, as indeed have developing countries, loss and damage in climate change. The fund has now been capitalized. Germany and the UAE announced last week in Dubai, I was there, that they are going to capitalize the fund by each contributing $100 million. That's a start. But guess what? The developed countries did not want to discuss loss and damage at all in the climate change negotiations. It was only because of the insistence and the sophisticated negotiating capacity of the group of 77 and China, the developing countries, that eventually they agreed to have a loss and damage provision in the climate change. So the moral of the story is, it's not necessarily about size, the issues that we decide really relate to power and principle. And if the principle is strong enough and you are resourceful and determined enough, you can achieve that power. You can achieve that influence. Proof positive, loss and damage. Thank you very much. A great pleasure being with you. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I will not attempt to summarize what we heard about, but just it was really um, a broad ride through the role of the United um, Nations, the UN General Assembly, agenda setting, um, global justice, human rights, um, the violence against women, um, the situation the UNGA has on the Gaza conflict right now, on many um, issues about bringing the poorest and the, the, those at the risk of being left behind back into um, the, the, the discourse and um, mechanism of prosperity and, and development. Um, these are all big issues that we are very, we care about and we hope to work together um, and here um, and with you to 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 make progress. It's not easy, but I'm very grateful for you that you came here, that you shared your vision, knowing that somebody like you has those ideas and those commitments and those values, leads the, and presides over the General Assembly um, is, is, is very important to know. I think for us, you created trust, um, you reignited that solidarity that we want to see with the United Nations. And on behalf of the entire Colombian CEPA community, I thank you for the work you're doing, and I hope to interact soon again. Like, hand for our guests. My pleasure.